Welcome back everyone, my name is Dr Anthony Cliff and on this channel, Anthony This Playlist, we're talking all things research, everything from how to do your interviews, how to do en vivo, coding, stuff like that, along with questionnaire design, SPSS, and in the next couple of weeks, including videos like this one, talking about how to survive the actual academic journey from undergrad through to PhD. So today we're going to be talking about how to finish your PhD in three years or under. So let's go. So in the UK, most people um, who are lucky enough are on a PhD scholarship and they typically get funded for three years. So there's often an expectation that you'll finish your PhD, um, usually the writing part at least, within three years. But that's not always the case. Some people often take around about four years, some people even five, and of course, if you're part time, even longer. But the average is between three to four years, there or thereabouts. The people often, in the UK at least, I know it's different around the world, will complete a PhD. Now, for me, I actually finished writing my PhD in two years, five months, and then I actually vivid and done all my corrections within two years, eight months. So I actually, from start to finish, was under three years by a couple of months. So I want to give you some tips, top tips of what I feel was really important about how to finish a PhD in that three year period. And of course, it's important that you do try and finish it as soon as you can, because A, your funding may well stop. And B, it shows good time management. So you might be able to do a gigantic project, I think, including my uh, appendices was 2,000, uh, 274,000, I think it was, overall my thesis. So to complete that amount of work and all your data collection within that time frame shows really good time management. And of course, academic jobs in 2021 are very scarce now and, you know, and, and the industry is not in the best place currently. So if you want to get into that kind of field, you want to try and beat the others who are coming out of that same system that you're in. So we're going to start off then talking about five key uh, tips that I had of my journey, which may well help you. So number one is work Monday to Thursday, nine to five, and treat it like an actual job. Now, if you are being paid um, to do a PhD, so I was on the scholarship, very fortunate enough to get that. But if you're somebody who's paying yourself to do it, treat it like a nine to five job. And like I say, working a four day week worked brilliant for me. The only time I worked a Friday or a weekend, a Friday is when I was at a conference in Croatia uh, delivering my research. Again, it's not really working if you're on a beach. And I had my Viva on a Monday, so the weekend before I was looking through uh, my work and that kind of stuff. And that's only over time I worked on a Friday or a weekend on the PhD. So if I can finish under three years working a four day week, so can you. And why is that important? Well, for me, if I knew I only had Monday to Thursday on the PhD and I was finishing at half five, then I knew I had a certain time frame to get things done. It made me more productive. It made me procrastinate a little bit less, although of course we always do. Um, but it's really important, I feel, that if you've got a short time to do things, you do become better at time management. You become more pro productive and more proactive in how you actually go about things. Because when you think about it at the start of your journey, if you've got three years to complete it, it seems a very long way away, but that goes incredibly quickly. And yes, we do have times on the PhD where it's a bit of a roller coaster where you won't have enough hours in the day, and there'll be other times where you're literally just twiddling your thumbs, uh, waiting for things to happen around you. So you want to make sure that you're maximising that time, um, say between Monday and Thursday, uh, often used to be like half eight to half four, half five, somewhere there or thereabouts is what I used to work. Really important as well on those Friday, Saturdays and Sundays that you try and switch off. So you're never going to switch off from your PhD. You're always thinking about what comes next. You're thinking about different types of work. But by not actually doing any PhD work and actually going out and have some fun, talking to friends, go hiking, you know, go go do sit stuff on those three days, it really just recharge your brain. So when you come back in on Monday, you're fresh and you're ready to go again, giving your brain that time to cope. Is definitely my number one tip is to set realistic and small targets as you go through your PhD. So yes, we have some institutional targets to hit and milestones. So you might have a registration form you have to complete. You might be a student who has to go on an MPhil first and then you do your MPhil transfer viva. Mm -hmm. Again, I was fortunate enough, I worked as a research assistant for a couple of years, so I managed to skip that 
setting, which yes, of course, uh, it did make it a little bit easier. So if you can get some research experience behind you before you join a PhD, that's one of those elements which you can skip because you've already shown the skills. But what I'm talking about here is often it's between 80 and 100,000 words that you've got to write eventually. And of course, you've got to design your data collection. You could be out physical measurements. You could be doing interviews, focus groups, those kind of things. You've got to plan them. You've got to make sure they happen at certain times. Now, often students struggle with the idea of writing that amount of words. So often what I tend to do is set really small, reasonable targets. Be that 500 words a week, something around about that. Always making progress towards that final end goal of that total. Now, by hitting those targets, and let's say, you know, let's say you're doing your lit review, for example, and you might be writing 5,000, 10,000 words. If you write 500 a week, then often you'll find by Tuesday, everything's gone a little bit easier. You've written that and you carry on and you've hit 1,000. Might even hit 1,500 on a good week. Next week, ugh, you might have something on. You might be doing data collection potentially. Well, you've already got those 500 words in the bank from last week. So you're going to have those ebbs and flows. But again, making those small targets makes that big target a little bit more manageable. So that is tip number two. Tip number three is to accept failure, get used to failure and get used to some criticism and developing a thick skin in your academic career pretty quickly and very early on. Now, there's a reason why only 2% of the global population have a PhD and that's because it's incredibly difficult to get. It's even incredibly difficult to get on to a scholarship if you're lucky enough to get on. You've got to beat so many other candidates and then you've got to survive three to four years of the PhD and then finally past that big viver at the end. So those who complete a PhD will have completed an undergraduate degree, often at least at a 2-1 category, if not above. They then would have went on to do a master's degree. And then finally, they beat everybody else at the interview to get onto their PhD program. So they're the top of the top. But the problem with that is, is that often you're not used to failure and you're not used to critical feedback because you've gone through your entire academic career being the best of the best and your feedback is often just, yeah, well done. So often students arrive on PhD programs thinking, yeah, I know everything. I'm going to be really good at this. And then it is a massive culture shock when you realize that actually, you know, very little at all and that you wish you actually failed along the way because believe it or not, you will have a lot of failures on your PhD. Be that critical feedback from your supervisors on, on various drafts, be that your data collection not working and even things out of your control as well. So getting rejections from paper, rejections of funding bids, uh, which you're not used to, or even things like I say, out of your control in terms of, for me, I waited a week for one of my models to render and the cleaner came in and switched off the, P the, the PC and I lost basically a week's worth of model rendering uh, from a PhD. It's frustrating, just get over it, accept it. For me, I was a 2-1 student, I got 65, uh, so right bang into me, I got merit. So I've been used to not being the top of the class, I've been used to having failures along the way. And like I say, I worked as an RA for a couple of years, which was brutal at times um, in terms of you know, criticism and management and that kind of stuff in an academic environment. So I was used to it. So I found it a little bit easier to roll with those blows. But I say often people join the PhD and they're top of the class and they're not used to that. So I talked to just don't take it personally um, you can't do Ac academia is a tough environment it's a tough world and particularly if you're writing papers reviewer two is always the annoying one it gives you really bad feedback take it on board there's always some merit in that and you've just got to accept it take it on the chin take the lessons away from it don't take it personally and move on tip number four is stop saying yes to everything now of course this is a challenge at times for some people so on a PhD, you're often going to get approached by um, professors and other academics to try and sweeten you up a little bit in terms of if you do my data collection for free, it gives you experience in that particular field or it might give you that technique, whatever it might be. I'd caution doing that. I don't think people should be doing things for free. Any students that I've ever worked with, we always pay them. Um, as students, as partners, I think it's valuable. You're you're doing a, you know you, your service. You've got the academic know-how to even be on a PhD. You should be paid. It's a little bit like asking an artist to do something for exposure. Exposure is not going to pay your bills. 
So it's really important that you only say yes to a particular set of things that you're really happy with. And often for me, I had a criteria really, is, is it something that I genuinely want to do? Um, is it something that I feel like I'm lacking? Is it something that I actually really want to do? Do I have time for it? Because at the end of the day, your PhD is your number one priority. And if you don't make it your number one priority, you're not gonna finish in that time, in that three years, because other things are getting in the way, it's gonna get lost. That should be your number one priority and always be your number one priority. So can you fit it in around your PhD? not the other way around. Are the people you work with, are they genuine? Are they genuine to help you or are you actually helping them and they're not really helping you? So again, often I see it all the time. I've seen it in my old institution. I see it in the institution I'm in now. It's professors see PhD students as free labor um, and people take it because they feel like they have to. You're allowed to say no. Um, like I say, your number one priority should be your PhD. Now, for me, I accepted some really good things on my PhD that I wanted to do. Um, I became an editor for a journal, for example, and yes, that's a lot of work, but I knew that was good for me personally. It's something I wanted to do, and it was good for the CV as well as we go through. I turned down a lot of um, jobs where people asking me to go into schools to deliver questionnaires. Didn't have time, already done it, didn't really care. And it's great to say no with that kind of stuff. And the good thing is, those who keep saying yes, Yes, you'll keep getting offers to do things, but again, at what detriment? They're only coming to you because they know you're gonna say yes, not because um, you're actually really good at what that is. So just be careful with that. So tip number four is stop saying yes and only say yes to particular things on your PhD. Finally, tip number five is make sure you've got a good team around you. Um, now, of course, this involves supervisors and I will be doing a, um, a video on this, about how to manage your supervisors as well as how they can manage you. Uh, and often sometimes that's out of your control. Um, certainly it was for me, I had supervisors given to me and I was really lucky that I have had fantastic supervisors throughout my whole academic career. But that's not the same for everybody. But when I'm talking about a team here, I don't necessarily mean your supervisors, I mean the team around you personally. So for me, again, very fortunate that was part of a cohort and we were all at different disciplines. We had psychologists, um, chemistry teacher, we've had sports uh, people in, in my office as it were. And that's really important that you build that team around you, possibly from different disciplines if you can, because that really does help you, A, develop your research because you're seeing things from different perspectives. It's great for the viber because you've got to justify your position to other people. And more importantly, it's a team who are going through the same experiences as you. So PhDs often are lonely. They say they're lonely, but they don't have to be. You can reach out to your fellow uh, postgraduate researchers, your fellow PhD students, develop that team around you because people have the best skills there that are untapped. They have the best experiences. And like I say, you're all in that boat. Often the boat feels like the Titanic, granted, but you're still in that boat together. And it's really important that you have that support and that network to bounce things off. I would not have completed my PhD in under three years if it wasn't for that team in our office uh, that we had and we managed to share things because life goes on as well around the PhD and you know things aren't always going to go plain sailing so you need that support network and friends and family yeah they're great they're supportive but they unless you're doing a your PhD you don't understand the pressures and the stress that goes into it so when you're trying to discuss things and, and let stuff out people outside of the PhD world just do not understand it. So it's important that you have that network around you who support you, help you through those challenges. And if you don't have that, it's gonna make things incredibly more difficult and everything a little bit slower as well. So like I say, they're my top five tips on how to finish under three years. It's a challenge, it's difficult, and of course, it's not gonna be useful for everybody in terms of they might be paying it, might have different jobs, those kind of stuff. But it is really, really important that you try and stick to at least a four day working week, make everything a little bit more efficient. Definitely make sure you stop saying yes to things and make sure you have a team around you. Okay, thank you and see you soon.